<clears throat> the views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of any major corporation whatsoever. And now, boys and girls and various, it's time to get out your trapper keepers and your locker mirrors, if that's even a thing. It's been a long time since I've had a locker. Mm hmm. So I don't know if it's if it's a thing. I think it was at one point in time, but it's not now. Anyway, it's homework time yet again on yes, the Popar Film Podcast. Ahem. People of the internet, may I have your attention, please? Please stop porn hubbing for a few minutes and pay attention. <laughs> Each week, this podcast assigns its listeners homework in the hopes of bettering people, nay, the globe. Mm -hmm. And this week on the Pope on Film, we are looking at a problem that is affecting children all across America. It Picture is. it, won't you? Your son is a straight-A student and first violin chair in the school orchestra. Then... When you least expect it, your perfect son listens to a Captain and Tennille record. Yes. And bam! Next thing you know, your son has the dreaded punk syndrome. Yes. Next thing you know, your bright shining young child has flock of seagulls hair and gets his makeup tips from Vampiro. Your son has become a punk. A story that you hear far too often these days, or those days. Today we will be learning how to combat the dreaded punk syndrome yes. with a very special look at the legendary 1987 ABC after school special, The Day My Son Went Punk! Yes. Now... A lot of our younger readers, our millennials, won't really know what an after-school special was. They don't have any frame of reference. So I did a lot of research, a massive amount of research. I, I, I went to my local library. I looked up books on ABC, on after-school specials. I went to the Library of Congress. I read book after book after book. I scoured the internet. And so now I can say, after an exhausting amount of research, after hours and hours, so many hours piled on top of hours, so much research, I can now tell our listeners that ABC after school specials were specials that ABC used to run after school. Yes. No, I'm not saying I'm a hero for all, all the research I did there, but, you know, I, I, you're welcome, I guess is what <laughs> I'm trying to say. You're welcome. So after-school specials were for preteens and teens. They were live-action sort of mini-movies. They would run only five or six times a year. They were usually around 3 or 4 p.m., right when the kids were home from school. Yeah. Hour-long mini-films that tackled such topics as lying, drinking, and in the case of this week's homework, dressing like Adam Ant. Yes. Now, I would like to take this time to say that uh, that Adam Ant joke I just did, I'm not proud of that joke. It's just that I went to a lot of websites. I read a lot of reviews of uh, uh, the day my my child, the day my son went punk. I, I, I learned a lot, went to a lot of different websites. I even heard a few podcasts talking about the day my son went punk. And every single solitary page I went on said that the kid was dressed as Adam Ant. Like there said wasn't that he a was single dressed as that no, he wasn't dressed as Adam Ant. Well, I, I felt that I still needed to say that because every other website and podcast has already made that joke. Yeah. So I felt I needed to also mention Adam Ant. I'm not proud of it, but I just wanted to uh, I don't know, continue the trend, I but, guess. But it is important, I think, to bring up Adam Ant because this kid is about as punk as Adam Ant is. Yes. Yes, very much so. Very you much know, so. You know, I mean I mean Adam Ant was a, a manager saying, you know, this punk thing is really popular. Yeah. 
You there. You're a punk now. Get him into costuming. Yeah. And and I, I had actually seen, I forget what the fuck his name is, but I had actually seen a documentary uh, about the guy who created Adam Ant. Yeah. You know? And tell me if this does not make sense. Once he was finished with Adam Ant, he grabbed Billy Idol. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. You know, so there's definitely a look that this particular guy likes. Yeah, I never liked Billy Idol. And then and then for and then for Andrew Dice Clay's movie, he wrote the song Cradle of Love. And that was a big hit and it was on the radio. And I guess that we were all supposed to just not look into the the meaning of the song. Yeah. Like it was weird that like a, a, a top ten hit on the radio was like Fucking underage girls. <laughs> Fucking underage girls. This is a top ten song. <laughs> You're hearing this song at the mall. Your mom knows the song about <laughs> fucking underage girls. Like, really? We're we're all supposed to be okay with this? <laughs> this is really uncomfortable. Weird. Now, ABC wasn't the only one doing these sort of specials. CBS had their own version of these. They called theirs the CBS School Break Specials, and I actually do remember those more so than the ABC ones. I don't I remember don't ABC remember after those. school specials. I don't remember ABC after school specials, but I definitely remember the CBS School Break Specials, which is weird. Yeah, well, I, I think they they stopped running. I think I think like. The heyday for ABC after school specials was more my age. Yes, you know, but here's because the they thing. would they would wind up bumping a good Godzilla movie or some shit, and it used to yeah. piss me off. No, I've got the dates. I've got the dates of how long it ran on ABC on ABC, and the the dates will surprise you. But NBC had their own version. NBCs were called NBC's Special Treat, which makes it sound like. Like, that's what Jared Fogle had to lure kids, you know? <laughs> Alternate joke, special treat could also be the name of Bill Cosby's new roofie-flavored energy drink for women. <laughs> also, also, it wasn't just the big three. Telemundo also had their own after-school special, but since it's Mexico we're talking about, theirs was a bit more blunt. Their specials were called Niños No Hacen Mierda Estupida. <laughs> which translates to kids don't do stupid shit. Mm -hmm. Theirs were more direct, more yes. blunt. But because they did so few of these after school specials, I mean, they're not breaking the goddamn bank with these after school specials. Yeah. They do it five or six times a year. It's only an hour long because they did so few. And because the specials were so economic, they were so cheap to make, they continued to do after-school specials for freaking ever. ABC after-school specials started in the beginning of the 1970s and ran all the way to 1997. I, I am surprised that they went that long. Really, like, what are they playing on ABC after-school specials in the 90s? Like, the grunge syndrome. <laughs> Billy bought one flannel shirt. Next thing you know, he caught the grunge syndrome. <laughs> there was also the classic 1994 ABC after school special, Billy's Pog Addiction. <laughs> Billy was a bright boy. Then he decided to buy one Pog. Next thing you know, he was in the alley sucking dick for Pog money. God, I'm glad I was too old for Pogs. I loved Pogs. I loved Pogs. Yeah. Because you're a baby. I, it'd be no, because I was like a theater geek, and when you're doing a play, you have a, a lot of time to kill. And like we would be sitting in the back, uh, you know, backstage going, what are we going to do with our free time? Because we don't, none of us have phones or the internet yet. Yeah. So what should we do? It's like, you know what? We should get those stupid Pogs that everybody's playing with. It's like, oh, those are stupid. Yes, we should definitely do that. 
<laughs> and so we would get like a crap ton of pogs, especially. And at first we were doing it ironically, but then we discovered that the like the Circle K by the high school yeah. sold nothing but remarkably violent anti-abortion pogs. Oh my god. <laughs> For whatever reason, the Circle K would sell these pogs that had like dead babies on them and like abortion is murder. And and so so that just made us love it more. And then, of course, because my brother won't let me have anything. Yeah. My brother went on vacation to Vegas and at it's somewhere on the strip. I'm thinking Caesar's Palace, but I might be wrong about that. He bought a thirty nine ninety five dollar uh pog slammer that's the the heavy thing that you use to slam the pogs yeah he spent like 40 dollars on one with a cobra on it and it was shiny he had to buy the most expensive pog thing basically uh, yeah i i am tempted me i'm tempted to ask what's wrong with him but we covered that yeah no we totally covered that but then, of course, Joe being Joe, after about six months, he didn't care about it. So that quickly became my slammer. So I really was the king of pogs. All right. So I had this, like, pog slammer that was that weighed as much as Eleanor. <laughs> of course, there was my favorite 1997 ABC After School special that was simply titled Debbie and Her Jinko Jeans. <laughs> it was all about a raver girl named Debbie who wouldn't take off her stupid looking Jinko jeans mm -hmm. that were like bell bottoms on crack. So they would be, they were like three times longer than bell bottoms. You'd just be dragging jeans on your way to the rave. Now there, there is one in particular ABC after school special that was a classic and that would be the wave. Oh yes. I remember the wave. We, we, yeah. we still sell, we still sell the book, the wave. Yeah. We still sell that. It's in our team department. And I and had I had tracked it down and watched it again as an adult. I forget when. And like it it still was really fucked up. Oh yeah. But then a couple of years back on Netflix there is a new wave out. Nice. And it's a German version. <clears throat> Oh, no. That's, yeah. That was frightening. And it was the same yeah, story, that, but it was frightening. Yeah. I would imagine that, that Germans would, like, not be excited to make a version of the wave. <laughs> Don't mention the war. <laughs> I've mentioned it a few times, but I think it's okay. <laughs> So, with all of the meticulously researched research out of the way, let's now discuss the special itself. Yes. It's crap. It's it's crap. It's it's, it's, it's just But it's shit. still fun crap. It is. It's really this fun This is like crap. this is like the best homework that we have had since I'm not really sure when. Since uh the Burning Hell, I was a big fan of the Burning Hell. Well, no, the Burning Hell was was good, but but this was differently good. Yeah. Okay. You know, this was more. It was it was fun. It had a yeah. bit of charm to it. It yeah. was stupid as shit. Absolutely. You know, it it, it it barely handled its topic. Oh yeah, you know? it's obvious that it's also obvious that the people creating creating the special. I mean, it's a warning about punk that knows nothing about punk music. Yeah, it's it's and all, not only that, but like it came out at the end of 1987, and punk wasn't really a thing anymore. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, no, 1987. I saw. Yeah. yeah, yeah, punk. Yeah, we were pretty much well. Punk has always kind of been around, but it was definitely like hijacked by the hair bands by that time yeah it was yeah. absolutely yeah yeah but this is like they retrofitted a brady bunch script yes you know yes, that's a good way to look at it it was so bland <laughs> it was so 
a movie does not get whiter than this movie. Oh, no. Absolutely not. Obviously made by people who were not punks. Mm-hmm. That's just oh, that's yeah. the bottom line mm-hmm. right there. One of the things that I really love about this special is the cast. Because the cast is a veritable who's who of who? It's it's a it's a cast full chock full of people you vaguely remember. Yes. Like, oh look, there's the governor from Benson. Yes. <laughs> oh look, there's the doctor from the Love Boat. Oh hey, there's Lenny Kravitz's mom from the Jeffersons, and of mm-hmm. course there's the star Jay Underwood, who for a small <laughs> period in time in the eighties was going to be the next big thing on account of how blandly cute he was. Yes. He, he starred in The Boy Who Could Fly, which was fairly big back in the 80s. Mm-hmm. And then he was in a series of movies uh, for the Disney Channel called Not Quite Human. They did three Not Quite Human movies for Disney. It starred Alan Thick as a scientist who creates a like the first cyborg child and then tries to pass this kind of socially retarded robot child as his <laughs> son and um growing up with cable tv i swear to god in the late 80s early 90s the not quite human movies were on the disney channel all of the time <laughs> and this this is before the disney channel started coming up with like original programming so in the early days of the Disney Channel, you you could watch, you know, they would show Alice in Wonderland, and then yeah. they would show an hour of Mickey Mouse cartoons, and then they'd have some original TV show set in Disney World, and it was mm-hmm. just they would have these travel shows that I would watch all the time on the Dis- on the early Disney Channel, yeah, and it would literally just be this stand up comedian that would just be hanging out at Disneyland and Disney World and showing you the new rides and then doing like bits. There was one where he he was there, and we are here with uh, legendary bad guy Jafar. How you doing, Jafar? And Jafar looks all bad, and he goes. Interesting fact about Jafar, his name backwards is Rafaj. <laughs> and I, I still think of that every time I, I see Jafar. Oh, there's Jafar. You know what his name backwards is? Rafaj. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Jay Underwood was a huge deal. So you can imagine his excitement when in, in the late 80s, early 90s, he gets cast in his biggest role ever. Mm-hmm. He's cast as Johnny Storm in the big budget Fantastic Four movie that is definitely going to come out and is not just being created so that Roger Corman can keep his copyright. Oh, fuck. That was him? That was him. He was Johnny Storm in the shitty Fantastic Holy Four. Shit. I totally missed that. And there's a documentary on that movie on Amazon right now. Oh shit! I gotta go look at that. I gotta go. I gotta see the shit out of that. I I got the Amazon Prime. But yeah, no, that was totally him. That was totally him. He was Johnny Storm. He was the first Johnny Storm. Like that's not a big role, but for us, that's a big role. Yeah. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. And I would like to go back to Alan Thicke, if I may. Sure. I like. To go back to Alan Thick, if I may, because last week we were talking about I was trying to explain the day my son went punk and I was talking about the star. And I said that the star was uh, in the 80s for a small period in time. It seemed like he was going to be the next big thing. He was in a couple of movies like The Boy Who Could Fly. And I couldn't remember the name, not quite human, but I was like, he was in these movies where he was a robot and they were on the Disney Channel all the time. And he starred with. Oh, shit, what's the name of that guy? He was on that sitcom, and I couldn't remember his name. That was the thing. I couldn't remember Alan Thicke's name. And last week on the podcast, I was wrestling time to remember Alan Thicke's name. So apparently, that infected my dream. Okay. Because because Alan Thicke, like literally a couple of hours after doing the last episode of the podcast, I had an Alan Thicke-related dream. That's frightening. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's even weirder when you learn what the dream was. So it, it, 
And, and the best part is, I've got this on tape. You got it on, okay. It, it, well, I never remember my dreams, ever at all, period, whatsoever. I occasionally have dreams, but once I wake up, it just automatically disappears. So anyway, I had this weird-ass dream, and I... I was having this weird ass dream and Alan Thicke was in it. And then the baby started freaking out mm -hmm. because Natasha like left the bed to go to the bathroom and the baby realized it and started crying. So she's like, I need to go to the bathroom, hold the baby so that the baby doesn't fall off the bed. And I'm half asleep. I'm still kind of asleep, but I'm wake. Uh, I'm awake enough to know that I'm not going to be able to go back to the dream, and that sucks. And it's like, holy shit, I remember my dream right now. And so I, I'm half asleep, and my eyes are, like, glossed over, and, I, I, and I'm barely conscious. But when Natasha comes back to bed, I start telling her my dream. And it's so obviously weird and fucked up that... My wife, being the smart woman she is, immediately whipped out her phone and started recording me. <laughs> She's so freaking smart to do this. I never would have thought of doing this, but she whipped out her phone and said, I'm sorry, what was that again, honey? And I explained my dream perfectly to the phone. I don't even know the phone is in front of me because I don't have my glasses on and I'm still half asleep. But apparently what I told my wife was the dream, which was I was at college and I was sad about a breakup. I don't remember who the breakup was with, but I was sad about the breakup and I was while I was walking through college, I noticed there was a fast food restaurant on campus and um, uh What's his name from Brooklyn Nine Nine and Hot Rod? Thank oh. you. Andy Sandberg is working at the fast food restaurant. Okay. But I've been watching a lot of Brooklyn Nine Nine, so I'm pretty sure that it wasn't actor Andy Sandberg, but actor Andy Sandberg's cop character Jake Peralta being Woo! undercover. Okay. At this fast food restaurant because. Apparently, at this fast food restaurant, they serve regular food, but if you pay a lot more, and I mean a lot more, and I mean a shit ton of money, if you're, like, rich and you pay a shit ton of money, they will serve you their fast food with tiger meat. Okay. And I'm pretty sure that's why Andy Sandberg's character, Jake Peralta, was working at the fast food restaurant, so that he could get to the bottom of the tiger meat case. So he is just working at the fast food place and there's people waiting in line to get regular food. And then suddenly a bunch of people get mowed down, a bunch of people get mowed down by a huge limousine that okay. just drives through campus and on the sidewalk and people are just bouncing off of this uh, limousine and the limousine window rolls down, and it's actor Alan Thicke, and he's come for a tiger meat meal. And I'm sad, and I'm walking through campus, and I'm sad about the breakup, and I'm like, hey, that's Andy Sandberg. He's working at that restaurant that serves tiger meat. Oh, my God, that's Alan Thicke. Alan Thicke has come to buy tiger meat. Is Andy Sandberg going to give it to him? Is Andy Sandberg going to try and take down Alan Thicke? And that's when I woke up. So Natasha perfectly got this on camera I'm where I'm just there. Andy Sandberg was working at a food restaurant that served Tiger Meat. It's a perfect video, and I keep telling Natasha to send it to me so I can put it on the internet. I think yeah, oh, my God, it belongs there. It, it must, it's yeah. fucking hilarious. It's right up there with all of those videos of those people who, like, come home after having, like, dental surgery, and they're all whacked out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's weird because, like, a couple of hours before, I was racking my brain on the podcast trying to remember this actor's name, and then once I went to sleep, my brain went, okay, Steve, did you guess the answer? The answer was <laughs> Alan Thicke. Here he is buying tiger meat. Like, my brain knew the answer. I just didn't know. So yeah. my brain just let me know. And, like, I couldn't think of his name, but once I woke up, I'm like, that was Alan Thicke, all right. Alan Thick, thank you, Brain. 
<laughs> Quite fascinating. So yeah, I'm having Alan thick dreams now, and that's pretty awesome. And and, and and yet still frightening. Yeah, yeah. You you shouldn't. I I think you should see somebody. You know, you hey. shouldn't be you shouldn't be dreaming about Alan Thick. Hey, I I see a lot of people. I like to fight around. I'm like Batman. <laughs> I like to fight around. So this special, this special is shite and it's absolutely garbage. But it's like a fun garbage. Yes. It's about the nerdy kid in the school orchestra, which apparently is a thing. My school just had a freaking band, but I guess I wasn't fancy like the Love Boat family. Yeah. Yes, Maxwell. Uh, can, can, can uh, I tell Bernie my dream? Oh, you had a dream that, that you totally dreamt and aren't just making up right now because I'm talking about dreams on the podcast. Absolutely. Whoa. Tell Bunny what your dream was, Maxwell. Okay. okay. I was at home. At a, at a forest, and I was going to my uh, safety room in my safety wood house, but uh-huh. it was good, and I heard a bear, and I I got, and I, and I was fighting it, but it scratched me, and uh, I, and I uh, punched it in the face, but... It punched me back. The bear okay. punched you back? And, yeah. It was so hard. And I just no. punched him in the face. Like, one million times. I can't see you. And, and, I, and then the bear punched me in the face. The bear punched you in the face. Basically, Maxwell, you dreamt the movie The Revenant. You have... Basically, you're dreaming Leonardo DiCaprio films. Next thing you know, you're going to have a dream where you're doing cocaine off of a woman's butt. Since we're sharing dreams. Yes, since we're sharing dreams. And, yes, and honey. Steve said that he's never in anybody's dreams. I did say that, yes. I thought I would share a dream that... Uh, I was actually in, because I don't exist in anyone's dream universe. You were in it, but it was so fucked up, I didn't tell you about it. Oh great! This is going to be uh, this is going to be horrible to hear, but this is already really good podcasting. So okay, go ahead. Okay. Your... So in my dream, I was watching this YouTuber, oh, and God. this YouTube video was instructions that I was following. Okay. This YouTuber instructed me to go to the store and get the specific brand of liquid laundry detergent. And I had already ordered my medical supplies. So then they instruct you on how to run an IV into your arm. Okay. How to set this liquid laundry detergent up into the IV. Good. It, so it's a cleanse. It's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's a cleanse. It's like a diet. Sure. Let's go there. <laughs> and. I went ahead and I was like, all right, this is what I'm going to do. And Steve was there and he was like, I don't want you to do this. And I was like, well, what do you want from me? He was like, look, and I, these are words that, that Destiny had said to Deanna like two weeks ago. Destiny was like, look, if you want to kill yourself, I don't want to live in this world without you. But if that's what's going to make you happy. And so, like, Steve basically said that to me. Okay. And I was I don't know what's going to make me happy. I just don't want to exist anymore. I don't want to live. And so I went ahead and uh, I ran an IV of liquid laundry detergent into my system, just like the YouTuber said to. Uh-huh. And then the YouTuber told, told me that I would have an hour. So uh, to get all, you know, make sure I have all my affairs together beforehand. I'd have an hour before... I'd have an hour before I went ahead and, you know, was gone and that I would feel tired towards the end. So I could just fall asleep and never wake up. Okay. And so I did it. And Steve was supportive. He was so supportive of me. He was I sad, was so but he was supportive. He was like, if this is what you want to do. And then I did it. And then I realized that I didn't want to do it. I was like, no, what do I do? What do I do? And so I called the YouTuber. Yeah. And she, like you do. Like you do. Like, like you, you do. do. You just call the YouTuber up and you're like, hey. Uh, and so she was obviously still alive. Um, 
and you can she, call her. Yeah. yeah. And she was like, well, sorry, there's nothing you can do. You could probably try to go to the ER, but I don't think there's anything they can do to help you either. And if that's if you'll make it there in time, I suggest you just sit back and relax. Panicking is going to make it go faster. It's like, oh, okay. the worst part of it was that I felt the detergent go into my system and I felt the burn through my entire bloodstream. Yeah. And it was so real and so freaky. And I, when I woke up, it was just freaked me out. But Steve was in my dream. But if you actually do it, you could stand outside of Roman's cave. Who's that? What? I could stand outside of Roman's cave. Oh! (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Yeah. No, I'm not going to actually do it. But Steve, I heard Steve say earlier that he was never in anybody's dream. So, and then Maxwell decided to share, and I thought, okay, so this is dream share time. Two yeah. birds, one stone. I'll share a dream, and uh, Steve was in it, so I gotta share it now. What when what was color that? was the was the dishwashing? It was liquid? blue. It was blue like dawn or something was, like that. It was blue. No, it wasn't dawn. Definitely wasn't dawn. Hey, stop doing it. Shush, shush, shush. Uh, yeah, it wasn't Dawn, but it was blue. It was laundry soap. It wasn't dish soap. And it was weird. I, it was so real. I haven't had a, a, a dream that real in a very long time. Yeah. I think I'm just stressed. When did you have this dream? I don't know. A week ago? A week ago? That's nice. You should have dreams about Alan Thick. Alan <laughs> oh, thick, yeah. He was the I'll, Seavers dead. I'll Rowing things. All, all the punk kids are doing it. Yeah, all the cool kids are having Alan Thick dreams, honey. And Andy Samberg and yeah. Tiger Meat. Yeah, Tiger Meat dreams. Everybody's having Tiger Meat dreams nowadays, honey. It's Can just I the thing. It to you? It's processing. Okay. I can't so, um,. Basically, Jay Underwood has middle child syndrome in this special. And his family is full of annoying upper class twits with white privilege. He has a Alex B. Oh, they had white privilege up the ass. Yeah, he had white privilege up the ass. His older brother was Alex P. Keaton. He had a prissy little shit of a little sister. And parents that did not give a crap about him at all. Yes. At all. Literally, his parents were just like, oh, you're leaving for the summer. Oh, we're not going to see you all summer. Well, uh, bye. See you later. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, mm-hmm. no shit he goes punk. I would have gone punk, too. I specifically love the scene where where he walks into the stuffy hotel where he'll be working at during the summer. Yeah, because it's a it's a broken monocle moment. Yes. You know, and there's all these stuffy people in the hotel, and none of them have monocles. But if they did have monocles, then those monocles would automatically like fall into their uh, glasses of Chardonnay and break. Yes. Mm-hmm. Really beautiful. The kid looks stupid too. Yes. Like the make. Hey, let's the- let's not forget he was also a young Republican. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now they didn't really do anything with that plot. Pl- plot point really but he was a young republican yeah but i love the i i love that the i i think the makers of this special this film is whatever are confusing punks and goths because i i don't know of any punk that would put weight makeup and white face paint on no no yeah he he wasn't punk he yeah he, he was he was your basic hollywood depiction of a punk he was judge dread punk yeah you know yeah where yeah. where where you know star trek the voyage home punk you know yeah. not the punks you ever saw who would like oh listen to punk music you know or be in a punk band yeah you never saw anybody dressed like that kid oh no not at all yeah 
So, but the kid wins over the people at the hotel because no matter how he looks, he's still a nice guy inside. But then his mom shows up yeah. to the hotel. She is doing a lecture on punk syndrome at the hotel where his son is now a punk. Mm-hmm. And, um, okay, did the mom not know that they were having the conference at the same hotel where his son is working. Well, that's kind of how much they didn't give a shit about him. (laughs) So it's like, yeah, okay. I understand that like your parents don't give a crap about you. So you turn punk, but like, God damn Jay Underwood shares some of the blame here (laughs) because you should know that your mom is going to do a lecture at the place where you've, where you where you're going to be working that summer like this is partially your fault Mm -hmm. you know you just seem to be bad at this (laughs) you are bad at punking yeah like that one kids in the hall skit where the guy's leaving on a plane trip and he says goodbye to his girlfriend and then while he's on the plane his girlfriend comes on the plane with her boyfriend. And it's like, like number one, how could you cheat on me? Number two, how could you be so bad at cheating? <laughs> and she's like, well, I don't know. I thought it was a big plane. <laughs> it's like, yeah, so you, Jay Underwood is just, yeah, no, you're really bad at punking because you should definitely know that your mom is going to be doing a conference about being punk at the hotel where you're at. Like, you're really bad at this. You share some of the blame here. Yeah. Anyway, by the end, everything's better. Yada, yada, yada. Although Jay Underwood doesn't get first chair violin. Everything's okay at the end. But nothing, but nothing ever, ever gets, like, bad. Ever. Yeah. Some some people disapprove. But he wins them around by bribing little rich cripple kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It it and also like I don't care how nice you are. I don't want someone dressed as a punk taking care of my kids. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. I'm sure you sing really great songs, and I'm sure you're a really nice kid. But maybe not dress like a weirdo freak while you're taking care of my children. Just a thought. <laughs> maybe I'm the bad guy here, but... Well, you're sounding like a rich white woman now. Well, no, I just feel like <laughs> this hotel doesn't have a fucking dress code. Yeah, right? This hotel has to have a dress code. I, I, and especially since it's like an upper class kind of a place. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Anyway. And, and this is like a dream job. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, you got to figure with the privilege that was absolutely dripping off of everybody in this movie. Absolutely. This is at least got to be a a, a five-star hotel. Yeah. Okay? And he is taking care of the children. He has got to be getting somewhere around $30 an hour for that. Yeah, he's got to be paid a pretty decent amount. Yeah. I mean, this is not the equivalent of flipping burgers. It's yeah. not even in the neighborhood. Yeah. He probably had to have background checks run on him for him to work at this hotel. Yeah. Anyway, fuck all after school specials. They never spoke for teens because they're made by just stuffy old white people. Yes. Like, I don't think after school specials ever changed anybody. (laughs) You know, I don't think that there are people out there that were like, 
oh, gee, I was going to be a punk, but then I learned my lesson. Thanks, ABC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, this didn't change anybody. And and the whole thing was definitely... Oh, yes. I have heard of punks. I will write this. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Very much so. Yeah. Anyway, that is it for homework this week, and we sincerely hope that your eyes, minds, and clogged arteries have all been suitably open. Aha! Though, don't you're not going to get out that easily. Don't forget next week's homework assignment, and for next week, episode 131, I've done something a little bit different. There was one video on YouTube that I kind of wanted to do as homework, but then there was this other video that I found, and I thought this might be homework. Then I said, fuck it, and created a homework assignment playlist. Okay. It is on YouTube already. It's tpof ep.131 homework. It is a homework assignment on playlist of on YouTube of various things, including a 20-minute video on Phoenix, Arizona from the 1960s. <laughs> it's a weird travel video they made in the 60s. Like, like one of those like school videos. Yeah. That is why they call Phoenix the Valley of the Sun. <laughs> I also have uh, on there, and we watched it today. We watched the entire thing um it's a strange found video and i really feel the need to explain it before you watch it do you know what a fred myers is bunny a fred myers it sounds familiar yes i do you do yeah yeah it's like a um i guess they call it a superstore now yeah like a, big like a target store. or a walmart but it's uh, owned by kroger it's okay yeah. yeah, um apparently they're only in like four or five states, but like I've never been to one. But anyway, um so this guy recently found his old camcorder in storage and there was a VHS tape in it and he said, "You know what? I'm going to take it to one of those places that does, you know, uh VHS to DVD and I'll get it, you know, I'll I'll convert it." Yeah. So he he went to convert it and he found out that it not only was the video filled with like home movies and stuff like that, but apparently the videotape came with the camcorder and the camcorder was the demo camcorder at a Fred Myers in in 1992. So this guy inadvertently has 26 minutes of video from inside of a Fred Meyer box store in 1992. <laughs> and it is a fascinating look. It's weird to see, like, like at first I'm watching it as a joke, but then I find myself invested. I'm like, oh, hey, there's the manager walking by again. Oh, hey, there's that one girl that, that looks all weird. Oh, she's looking into the camera. How long is that guy going to look through the records? <laughs> the guy's been there for like 12 minutes. Move on. <laughs> but the most amazing thing is just to see, like, like, I, like I'm telling, I, I told Bella over and over again, look at everybody, Bella. None of them have phones. <laughs> None of them are staring into devices. Mm -hmm. No one's texting. No one's on a phone call. And it really does feel like we shopped different. Yeah. Because everyone is more invested in the store and invested in the displays and talking to each other and looking around. And it just seems that people are more connected And it really makes me think now, like after watching this found video, then going to like work and looking around and I'm like, holy shit, we completely changed. (laughs) Like there's no way to fully realize that until you see a 26 minute minute video inside of some random ass Fred Meyer store. (laughs) But it's it's an amazing video. There's a there's I think there's like 11 or 12 videos on the playlist, but the the main ones 
are like the 20 minute travel video from Phoenix, Arizona in the 60s. And a look inside of a Fred Meyer store in 1992. The guy actually didn't know how old the video was. So he put the video on Reddit uh -huh. and uh, Reddit figured out that if you put the volume up really, 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 really loud, not only can you hear like the cashiers and you can hear people talking and some guys signing up for like a like a like a plan of some kind. Yeah. But you can just barely hear the music that's playing in the store overhead. And it's like, OK, in this part, they're definitely listening to a Tracy Chapman album. <laughs> and uh, that's definitely the Wayne's World 2 soundtrack. So, OK, this is about 1992. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. It is a fascinating thing to watch i think that my kids and i might might record like an audio commentary track to go over it see see this this may be very interesting because i do not look at people when i go shopping i i yeah. am i am a man shopper i yeah. i i once needed clothes and i bought three pairs of jeans five shirts uh socks and new shoes and was out in 15 minutes. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, no fucking around here. Somebody could be dead and bleeding out in an aisle and I I won't pick up on that. Yeah. You know, so this this should be interesting actually watching people shop. Yeah, it, it, watching this video really did make me pay attention more to my surroundings. Because <laughs> it definitely does feel like we have changed in the way that we shop. Yeah. It's quite interesting. It, it, uh, the Onion AV Club called this uh, possibly the greatest documentary ever. Uh, the greatest documentary released in 2017 so far. <laughs> like the headline said, like, this year's greatest documentary is a uh, uh, 1992 found footage of a Fred Meyer convenience store. <laughs> it's quite interesting. Anyway, that's next week. So be sure and look for the Pope on film episode 31 homework playlist on YouTube and keep your feet on the ground. Keep reaching for the stars and we will see you next week for homework with the Pope on film podcast and cut. Yeah.